Well, welcome back, statistics uh, students. Uh, today we're going to be talking about something that's theoretical, hypothetical, and what I like to call is infinity land stuff. But And so this discussion, just keep in mind that we're having sort of a hypothetical, infinity land, theoretical, conceptual, you kind of got to think about it conversation about things that we can't touch. Now, it doesn't make them not real. It doesn't make them not true. It's just something you're going to have to sit with and think about in order to understand it deeply. And it's one of these important tools we're going to need in our conceptual toolbox to be able to ask and answer cool research questions. And it's the whole where, where the arc of this class has been going up to this point. And sort of this is one of the last tools in the toolbox that we need to understand in order to be able to ask and answer cool research questions. And because today's conversation, we're jumping away from having one sample, we're jumping away from looking at one set of people, and we're going to start playing hypothetical mind games. Like, what would happen if I had an infinite number of samples? And you're like, well, that could never happen, right? I can't actually get an infinite number of samples. But happily, math to the rescue, we actually know what would happen if we had infinite numbers of samples. And that's what today's uh, conversation is all about. Sampling distributions, which is this idea of what would happen if I had an infinite number of samples, and the central limit theorem, which tells us everything we ever wanted to know about uh, sampling distributions. So, what is a so first things first, what is a sampling distribution? And then after we've wrapped our head around that, the idea of what is this concept called a sampling distribution, then we're going to learn all about something called the central limit theorem, which is some rules. Not guesses, but rules, where we know everything we ever wanted to know about uh, this thing called the sampling distribution. So that is how this uh, lecture is going to go. So. Here's the basic idea behind a sampling distribution. I want you to imagine a population. Let's say it's a population of all the people in the, on the entire planet, 7.3 billion people, and I want to test the IQ of all 7.3 billion people on the planet. So I grab a sample of 10 people. Only 10? Yes, sample of 10. So that would be... N equals 10, right? Yep. I grab a sample of 10 people and I measure their IQ and I get I get some sample average for them. Let's say it's 101. Then I grab another sample of 10 people. Another one? Yep. So we'll call this X bar 1. Let's grab another sample of 10 people. We'll call this X bar 2. Let's make it 99. And I do this again and again and again and again and again and again and again, where I grab 10 people, calculate their average IQ, and then I toss them back. And then I grab 10 people, calculate their IQ, and then I toss them back. And then I grab 10 people, and then I calculate their IQ, and then I toss them back. The idea is if you do that, you could then create a plot, a density plot, remember those, or a histogram of not the raw scores now, but of all of these descriptive statistics, these averages. And so now you have a graph, not of people's IQs, well, not directly, not each individual person's individual IQ, but now you have a density plot or a histogram of the averages of each of the groups of 10, each of the samples of 10. And you have a distribution. You have a distribution of sample averages, where the numbers at the bottom are not people's raw scores anymore, but the numbers at the bottom are people's are the averages for each of your samples of 10. And so it's called a sampling distribution because it's a distribution of sample statistics. In this case, I've been describing sample averages. And so that would be called a sampling distribution of the mean. You could do this for any descriptive statistic, right? You could get a sampling distribution of the median. You could get a sampling distribution of the variance. You could get a sampling distribution of the mode, if you wanted. But we're going to stick close to what's called the sampling distribution of the mean, where you say, I'm going to grab an infinite number of samples where each sample has 10 people in it. 
or I'm going to grab an infinite number of samples with 100 people in it, or I'm going to grab an infinite number of samples with three people in each sample. Bottom line is you grab a sample of people, calculate some descriptive statistic for them, like the average, toss them back, and grab another sample of people with that same sample size, calculate the same descriptive statistic, like the average, and toss them back, and then do that infinity times. Infinity times? Yes, do it infinity times. And then if you create a density plot or a histogram of all of those sample statistics, like all of those sample averages, you now have a sampling distribution. And if you've done it for the averages, if you've calculated the average, the arithmetic mean, remember the mean? It's called, it's the same thing as the average. If you do it for the arithmetic mean, the average, then you have a sampling distribution of the mean. A distribution of an infinite number of sample means. So let me draw you a picture. So before, when we were talking about IQ, and let's say I got, and I told you that IQ was normally distributed, right? And if I drew a sampling, uh, if I drew uh, just, this is the population, right? The population has an average of 100, right? Has a standard deviation of 15. And so down here were people's raw, and so put 85 over here just so we refresh our memory. So these are people's raw scores down here along the x-axis, right? This is the x-axis, and the IQ then is the x variable, right? x-axis, x variable, right down here. These are people's raw scores. There's a person with a score of 85. There's a person with a score of 100, right? That's the idea. And then over here along the y-axis is how probable, is how probable people's scores are, right? So down here, so this is a, this is, this is a density plot, right? It's a, you, I, if, I, I, if I had bars, it would be a histogram instead of the nice smooth curve, right? But, it, this, but this is a regular distribution of scores, people's raw scores. And it could be a population, could be a sample, doesn't matter. Down here along the x-axis are people's scores, raw scores. 85 is someone, individual person's score. But a sampling distribution says, no, 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 we don't want people's raw scores. A sampling distribution says to put the averages along the x-axis, so the means. So now the x-axis is for your infinite number of x-bars. So you're going to grab one sample and calculate the average. You're going to grab another sample and you're going to calculate the average. You're going to grab another sample and you're going to calculate the average. Again and again and again, an infinite number of times. And then you're going to have a density plot of an infinite number of averages. And more on this in a minute, but it turns out averages are normally distributed, right? So now, but now, so this is a sampling distribution. And if I identify a number on this, let's say this is 105. This line here would be 105 on the graph, right? Down here would be the number 105. That 105 isn't someone's score. That 105 is the average for one of your samples, the average for one of your samples. And so then each number down here on the number line is going to represent an average, an average for one of your samples. and an important thing to remember is on a sampling distribution, each of your samples has the same number of people in it. So this could be a sampling distribution of five people in each sample. This could be a sampling distribution of 10 people in each sample. This could be a sampling distribution of 1,000 people in each sample. The bottom line is each number is a single sample average. And that is a sampling distribution, a distribution of sample statistics. Now, if it's a sampling distribution of the mean, 
If it's a sampling distribution of the mean, then this is a, a distribution of sample means. That's the idea behind a sampling distribution. Instead of, instead of tracking people's raw scores, you're grabbing samples of people, calculating their average, and then tossing them back. Grabbing a sample of people, calculating their average, and tossing them back. And theoretically, a sampling distribution is an infinite number of these samples taken from the same population. So I've got a population of people, and let's say instead of IQ this time, I'm talking about extroversion. And I, grab a and, and I say I grab a sample of 100 people. So now this is going to be a sampling distribution where each sample has 100 people. So I'm going to grab a sample of 100 people, calculate their average extroversion, and then toss them back. Grab a sample of people, another sample of 100 people, calculate their extroversion, and then their average extroversion, and then tossing them back. And then grabbing another 100 people, calculating their average extroversion, x bar, and then tossing them back. And each one of these samples is probably going to be a little bit different from each other, right? Because you've got this population, but each sample is going to be, you know, a, a unique set of 100 people. Now, and if you do this an infinite number of times, there's going to be different combinations of all the different people, right? And so you're doing it an infinite number of times. An infinite? Yes, an infinite number of times. You're grabbing a sample of people, calculating their average, and tossing them back. And each sample is going to be a little bit different because you're just a, a, a small sample is never going to be perfectly representative of the population, although it might be pretty close, right? And we call this idea that samples are going to be different from each other. We call this idea sampling error. So it's applying what we learned about people, that people are going to be different, and we, call, and we calculated the variance and the standard deviation to represent how people were going to be different. Well, now we've got this idea that samples are going to be different. Samples are going to be different from each other. When I grab my first sample of 100 people, they're going to have an average and I toss them back. And when I grab my second sample of people, they're going to have an average, maybe pretty close to each other, right? But maybe I randomly get a weird sample. Bottom line is there's going to be variability among our samples. And this is called sampling error. The idea that each sample is supposed to be a representative of the population, but samples are going to be different from each other and different from the known population. Not a ton different, but there will be some error due to sampling. Each sample is not going to be a perfect representative of the population. Now, some of them might be, like you might actually get a lot of samples that look, ex if you do it an infinite number of times, if you do it an infinite number of times, you're going to get some samples that are perfect, look exactly like the population. But some samples are going to look a little different from the population, and, and some other samples are going to look even more different from the population. But bottom line is, samples are going to be different from each other. And this is called sampling error. Not because anyone has done anything wrong, but anytime you know, you know theoretically, you know samples are going to be different from populations, just because they are, 100 people may reflect the population perfectly, but not all samples will reflect the population perfectly. And so we call that sampling error, sampling error. And so this distribution, this sampling distribution of the mean is going to have variability. Right? So when I get my, my density plot of my infinite number of averages, it's not all going to be the same number. Some of the x-bars are going to be super close to the true population average. Some of the x-bars are going to be a little farther away from the true population average. And some of the x-bars are going to be even farther away from the true population average. So that distribution of an infinite number of averages is going to have some variability. So the, the x-bars are going to be different from each other. Just as people are different from each other, sample averages are going to be different from each other. Because let's say, let me, so let me give you another example. So let's say I'm looking at um, enthusiasm, right? Enthusiasm for one's you know, school. 
and I'm and, and I and I'm looking at all the colleges across the United States, and I'm grab and I and I'm grabbing samples of students from across the United States. And let's say my sample size is 50. Every single time I grab my sample, I'm going to grab 50 people. So I grab my first sample of 50 students. Some of those students, and, and, and I want this sample to represent the population well. And, you know, if I randomly sample, it probably will, right? So I grab my sample of 50 students, and I calculate their enthusiasm, and I toss them back. But, and, they have, let's, and they're going to have some enthusiasm, some amount of enthusiasm. Let's say their enthusiasm score is, 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 uh, is I don't know, 102, however I measured it. So my sample size is 50. And my first sample, I get an enthusiasm score. I, for my first sample, I get an enthusiasm score of 102, right? And so, but then in my next sample, do you think I'm going to, and let's say the true population, let's say the true population enthusiasm, if I was able to get every single person's enthusiasm score is 105, right? And so my first sample, I get 102. And then in my next sample, I get 95 because eh, just random error, right? This is just random sampling error. That's the idea that each sample is going to be a little bit different. Now, will, be, will most samples, as long as I'm randomly sampling, be pretty close to 105? You bet. It's much more likely for me to get something close to 105 than it is to get a sample of students at zero or a sample of students at 200. But samples are going to have fluctuations, and that is called sampling error. Now, remember, you can take a sampling distribution of any statistic you care, you care about. You can do a sampling distribution of the median. You can do a sampling distribution of the variance. But we're not going to do that. We're only going to use the sampling distribution of the mean. And it's a theoretical, hypothetical thing, infinity land idea, where you're taking an infinite number of samples from the population. And thanks to the beauty of, of mathematical derivation, we know what an infinite number of samples will look like. We absolutely know. And we'll get to that in a second. But the idea is we're going to take an infinite number of samples from the population where each sample has the same sample size. Right? So you've got to decide ahead of time. Am I going to grab three people, calculate their average, and toss them back? Or am I going to grab 10 people, calculate their average, and toss them back? Am I going to grab 100 people, calculate their average, toss them back? Either way, you're going to be grabbing an infinite number of samples from the population. An infinite? Yes, an infinite. So you see how this is theoretical, hypothetical, and infinity land, right? Because, you know, in real life, we couldn't actually do grab an infinite number of samples. But the beauty of math is we can figure out what that would look like anyway, right? So we take an infinite number of samples from the population. You're going to find the mean for every single sample. And then you're going to plot those infinite number of averages on a density plot. So now, down here are all the infinite number of means. Down here on the x-axis are my means, my x-bars. The x-bars now are on the x-axis. And over here on the y-axis, still probability. Still probability. And what you're saying is, OK, where are the means now? Turns out averages are normally distributed. That, but that is the idea behind a, a sampling distribution. Because think about it this way, right? Let's say I have, I'm, I'm, let's say I'm measuring IQ again in an infinite, and the true population mean for IQ is 100. And it turns out it is. It's actually one of the reasons why it turns out it is is because they make it be 100. Every few years they retest everyone's IQ, and whatever the average is, they they they, re, they reset whatever that is at 100, right? So the average IQ is 100. We know it is, right? And if you grab a sample of people, you're probably going to grab something pretty darn close to 100, right? 100 is probably the most likely score for you to have when you grab your sample of people. You're, 
people uh, you're and you're not likely to get some uh, a sample of people who are so 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 smart that you get an average of 145 and you're probably not going to grab a sample of people all of whom are or sort of not quite so bright and where the average is like 70 because all of the people are not quite so bright right in general extreme samples those far away from the average of 100 will be less probable than getting samples close to 100. That's the, so that's the first thing I want you to try to wrap your noodle around. But could you grab a sample where the only people in your sample are super bright? You certainly could. Random stuff like that can happen when you're randomly sampling from a population. And could you grab a random sample of people, all of whom are not quite so bright, and so your average is pretty low? Certainly you could. But getting something close to the average, the true population average, grabbing a sample that is close to the true population average is, pr is more likely than grabbing something super extreme, grabbing something far away. So wrap your noodle around that first. Okay, so what am I describing? I'm suggesting that when I do my density plot, for my infinite numbers of samples, I'm, I'm grabbing samples from a population that does have an average of 100, okay? And, and, it's, and most of my samples, and remember, probability is over here on the y-axis, and the x-bars are down here. Getting a sample average, getting an x-bar close to 100 is probably the most probable. So if I put 100 on this graph, getting an x-bar close to 100 is, pro is more probable. See how higher probability? Because I'm drawing something high on the probability. Getting a sample average of 100 is more likely than getting a sample average of 145. So getting a sample average of 145 less likely. Getting a sample average of 60, less likely. Let's connect the dots. Hey, that looks like a normal distribution. And that is the first thing I want you to, to recognize, that sample averages are going to be normally distributed. And that brings us to the central limit theorem. Make sure at this point, you really understand what a sampling distribution is. That it's not a distribution of raw scores. It's not something you could actually do in any kind of study or experiment, where you could actually get a true infinite number of samples. But you can, but, but you can figure out, you can mathematically derive, we're not gonna do that in this, in, in this lecture, but you can actually figure out exactly what an infinite number of samples would look like. And some very smart people went ahead and did that. And, and they have, have come up with this set of rules about an infinite number of samples. If you grab an infinite number of samples from the population and calculate the average for those infinite number of samples, that, that we know what those infinite number of samples are gonna look like. And this set of rules is called the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem describes the characteristics of a sampling distribution of the mean. We know what the average of an infinite number of samples is going to be. We know what the variability, the standard deviation, of an infinite number of samples will be. We know the shape of an infinite number of sample averages. And, that is, and these rules make up the central limit theorem. And I'll explain to you, what, and, and we've already sort of wrapped our noodle around one of them, right? An infinite number of sample averages will be normally distributed because getting a, an x-bar close to the true population average is more likely than getting something super high or super low. And that's sort of our definition of normality, right? Getting something close to the average is more likely than getting something far away from the average. And so sample averages are normally distributed. Whatever the, tr whatever the population shape was, the averages will be normally distributed. So that's the first thing, right? The shape of an infinite number of averages, the shape of a sampling distribution of the mean will always be normal. Well, 
will always be normal as long as there's enough people in each average. But generally speaking, sample averages are normally distributed. And so we also know this, the average of all those averages, the mean of all those averages, and we know the standard deviation of all of those averages. And so here is what the central limit theorem tells us specifically. And I strongly recommend you being intimately familiar, in your own words, I should venture to say, of what the central limit theorem says. And so just remember, the central limit theorem is, are the rules. They're the rules about sampling distributions of the mean where if you know the population average from some, we'll call it the parent population, we'll call it the parent population, where I'm going to grab baby samples from this parent population. I'm going to grab an infinite number of baby samples from this parent population. If you know the average of that parent population and you know the standard deviation of that parent population, you don't actually have to grab an infinite number of samples to know exactly what those infinite number of samples would look like because the central limit theorem tells us the rules. Now, these rules are not guesses. They've been derived, but we get to just follow the rules. Hooray! But the rules make sense, and, I'll, and, and we will talk about, and I, I will talk about why these rules make sense. But here are the rules. So start with any population you care about. With, and, and know that average for that population. So you got to know mu, or you can't do this. And you got to know the standard deviation. You've got to know sigma for that population, right? You got to know mu, and you got to know sigma for that population. No matter what that population is like, if you know the average for that population, that parent population, and you know the standard deviation, the variability for that population, then you can also know for sure what the sampling distribution of the mean would look like for an infinite number of baby samples drawn from that population, where each baby sample has the same number of people in that baby sample. And so the central limit theorem says, number one, that the average of all of the x-bars the average of all of the means will be equal to the true population mean. And here's why that is. You can memorize the rule, but I want to explain why that's true. Think about it this way. When I'm grabbing my infinite number of samples, some of my samples will be overestimates, because let's take IQ as an example. I know that the average IQ, I know that the average IQ in the population is 100. I know that ahead of time. When I grab my infinite number of samples, some of, some of them are going to be higher, 105, 110, a very weird sample, 145. Some of them are, but some of them are going to be underestimates, uh, 95, 80, and some very weird samples, 60, right? But the overestimates and the underestimates are going to cancel each other out. And so when I get the average of all of the X bars, it's just going to be equal to the original population average. It's just going to be equal to mu. So the average of all the averages is going to be the original population average. So that's a nice thing to know, that when I have my sampling distribution of the mean, my density plot of an infinite number of averages, it's going to have a center point, which is exactly the same thing as the original population. It's also going to have an average of 100, because the overestimates and the underestimates are going to cancel each other out to arrive us right back at the population average. Now, there will be overestimates and underestimates, but there won't be more overestimates than there are underestimates. There's not going to be more 105s than there will be 95s, right? And so you're going to have a, an average of all the averages equal to the original population average of mu. The second thing that the, that the central limit theorem tells us is about the variability of my averages. It is sent, and the, the central limit theorem says that the standard deviation of an infinite number of averages, now again, this is not the standard deviation of the raw scores. This is the standard deviation of the averages. Oh, well, we should probably give that a new name, right? Since this isn't the standard deviation of the raw scores, this is the standard deviation of sample averages that are estimates, we should give it a new name. And so we do. We call the standard deviation of an infinite number of averages, we call that standard error. 
because that's the standard amount, each average is going to be an error of the true population average. It's the standard amount each x bar is going to be off. It's the amount of variability you might expect among our sample averages, our estimates. And so we call the variability for averages standard error. We called the variability in people's raw scores standard deviation. But now we're calling the variability in an infinite number of sample averages. We're going to call that standard error. So standard deviation gets a new name once we're dealing with sample averages. And, you're, and it is going to be related to the original standard deviation. It's going to be related to sigma. But it is actually going to be sigma over the square root of n. That is how you calculate this new concept standard error, the variability in an infinite number of averages. You start with the original population standard deviation, sigma, but then you're going to divide that by the square root of the sample size. You're going to divide that by the square root of, of however many people are going to be in your infinite number of averages. So let's use, continue to use my IQ example. So I know that the sigma for the standard deviation for my population of raw scores for people's IQ is 15. And then I tell you that I am going to grab I tell you I'm going to grab 25 people. Whoops, can't see that. I tell you I'm going to grab 25 people an infinite number of times. I'm going to grab 25 people, calculate their average x bar, toss them back. So the apparent population has, has an IQ of 100, an average IQ of 100, all 7.3 billion people have an average IQ of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. And now I'm going to draw my infinite number of baby samples from my parent population. And each one of my baby samples has 25 people in it. And so the standard deviation, not of the raw scores, but the standard deviation of my infinite number of samples, which gets a new name, it's called standard error, is going to be calculated like this. 15 over the square root of n. So 15 over 5. 15 over the square root of 25. The square root of 25 is 5, so 15 over 5 is 3. So the people, the raw score people, had variability of 15, had a standard deviation of 15. That's how spread out they were. The standard amount people differed from the average was 15 IQ points. But the sample averages only have a standard amount of error of three points because averages are less variable than people are. Think, Because think about it this way. In order to get an, I, an average IQ of, a, of 115, you're going to have to get a lot of people with above average IQ, right? And so, so sample averages are going to be less variable than the raw scores will be. And we'll demonstrate this. And so the people were spread out such that there was a standard deviation of 15, but the averages of 25 people, an infinite amount of 25 people, are only going to have a, a standard error of three IQ points. And, that, and, that is, and so it's sigma over the square root of n is the rule that we learn. You calculate the amount of variability in an infinite number of sample averages with sigma over the square root of n. And that will be the standard error, the standard amount each sample average will be in error to the true population average. The third thing that the, that the, the, the third thing that the central limit theorem tells us, the third rule, It is not a guess, it is true, is that as soon as your sample size gets large enough, sample averages will be normally distributed. Now, why is this? Well, that's because getting something, as long as your sample is big enough, right, as long as your sample size is big enough, 
getting something close to the true population average is more likely than getting a sample average far away. Getting a sample average close to 100 is more likely than getting a sample average of 80 and, and getting a sample average of 60 is even less likely. So getting a sample average of 100 is more likely than getting a sample average of 115. And getting a sample average of 130 is even less likely. So sample averages will be normally distributed as long as the sample size, as long as the sample size is large enough. And a sample size goes up as you go from samples with one person in them to samples with two people in them to samples with three people, to samples of five people, to samples of nine people, all the way up to sample sizes of 30, that you're, you're going to have a distribution of an infinite number of averages that gets more and more and more normal. And then once you have 30 people on each average, things look pretty darn normal. And you're just going to always have X bars that look normally distributed. So those are the three rules. And I've tried to explain why those rules are true, like why it makes sense that these are the rules. But if nothing else, you got to memorize the rules. This, these, these, this is what the central limit theorem tells us an infinite number of baby samples will look like without actually having to draw an infinite number of baby samples. We know exactly what a sampling distribution of the mean will look like without actually having to go and get an infinite number of samples, which is amazing, right? The beauty of the central limit theorem. Right? And so take some time, because I see this concept in your future, to think about what these three rules are, right? This, this slide and the last slide, super important for your future, right? Almost as if I'm going to want you to understand these rules and be able to talk about them in your own words. So, this, so know these three things. As a, as a sampling distribution, a sampling distribution is going to be normally distributed. An infinite number of averages is going to be normally distributed no matter what variable you're measuring. You could be measuring things like dice rolls where you have a uniform distribution. Remember uniform distributions? They look like rectangles where the ones are not more likely than the sixes. The sixes are not more likely than the twos. And if you roll the dice an infinite number of times, you would have something that looks like a rectangle. But if you start averaging those dice rolls, let's say you roll a dice five times. If you roll a dice five times and calculate the average of those dice rolls, those averages are going to start looking normally distributed, no matter what the shape, or let's say of the original population distribution. Or let's say you're talking about how much you love your dog. And we, and we talked about previously how, uh, how much people love their dogs is probably a skewed distribution. If I say in a scale of 1 to 7, how much do you love your dog, most people are like 7, 6, 7, 6. And occasionally there will be people who say 3 or 4. And then some really odd folks who say 1, I hate my dog. right? But even in a skewed distribution, once I start getting averages, those averages are going to look normally distributed. They just will. Um, no matter what the, the shape of the pop parent population, the sampling distribution of the mean is going to look normally distributed. And a sample size goes up from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. As the number of people in each sample goes up, sampling distributions start to look more and more and more perfectly normal. And then once you get to 30 people in each sample, Sampling distributions are perfectly normal. That perfect normal distribution that we learned about with 68% of the samples are going to be within one standard error, 95% of the samples are going to be within two standard errors, because remember, standard error is our new name for standard deviation, and 99.7% of all the samples will be within three standard errors. Perfectly normal distributions once you have 30 people in each sample. And as you go from 1 to 30, things get more and more normal. Also, as sample size, uh, at, at the, the way to calculate standard error uh, is sigma over the square root of n. Start out with the, po the apparent population standard deviation, sigma. Divide by the square root of your sample size, the number of people in each sample, right? If you have 25 people in each sample size, n is 25. If you have 100 people in each sample, sample size is 100, right? That is how you calculate the amount of variability among your samples. Sigma over the square root of n is how you calculate standard error. And as sample size goes up, standard error gets smaller. As sample size goes up, as n gets bigger, standard error gets smaller. 
because let's use my let's use my IQ example. If I have 25 people in each of my averages, my infinite number of averages, I'm going to have a sampling distribution with a standard error of 3. But now let's say I have 100 people. 100 people? Yep. Let's say I have 100 people in each sample average. Now I have a brand new sampling distribution. Now each one of my sample averages has 100 people in it. And so now standard error for my infinite number of averages is going to be 15 over 10. Or one and a half. So because there was more people in each sample, because there was more people in each sample, standard error got smaller, right? When you divide by a, a bigger number, the whole thing gets smaller, right? But also, this makes sense theoretically. A hundred people is going to be a whole lot more accurate in estimating the population than 25 people will be. And so each sample average is going to have less error. Each X bar is going to be a better representation of the population because there's more people in each sample. And so the amount of standard error, the amount each sample average is going to be an error from the population is going to be smaller. So as sample size goes up, standard error gets smaller. As you go from 25 people to 100 people to however many people are in your each, in each sample average, standard error is going to get smaller. Sigma over the square root of n is how we calculate standard error, which is our new name for the stamp, standard deviation for an infinite number of averages. And as sample size goes up, standard error gets smaller. And last thing again is that the mean of all of the averages will be equal to mu, whatever the original population average is, right? It's going to be equal to uh, the, the average of all the averages will be equal to the original population average because that any overestimates are going to cancel out any underestimates. And I think the central limit theorem is just like beautiful. I mean, I know I'm a weird person, but it just gets me excited. This idea that you don't actually have to grab an infinite number of samples to know what an infinite number of sample averages would look like. To me, that's just amazing. The central limit theorem, to me, is probably the most important thing that the, in, 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 the, in the study of statistics because it tells us what an infinite number of samples would look like, right? If you know what the parent population looks like, you know exactly what an infinite number of averages will look like. And to me, that's beautiful. That's just, that's just some, some amazing ideas right there. So I bet, since I think it's so important, it's probably going to be in your future. So I would really try to wrap my head around the central limit theorem um, because you're probably going to have to describe it in your own words. What are the three rules that the central limit theorem tells us about an infinite number of sample averages? And that's what we just talked about. All right. So something else I want to point out, because it's, it's, it can be a little bit of a point of confusion for many students. Sample size used to mean how many numbers do you have. But in a sampling distribution, you have an infinite number of averages, right? And so sample size, when we're talking about sampling distributions, refers to how many people are in each sample. N, N refers to not how many sample averages you have, because that is infinity, right? You have an infinite number of sample averages, theoretically. But that refers to how many people are in each sample, right? Not the number of sample averages you have, but how many people are in each sample. And so when you're talking about the central limit theorem, it's important that when, when you're talking about as sample size goes up, the distribution starts looking more and more and more normal, because let's say you're saying that, it's important to remember that doesn't mean as you get more samples, because how many samples do you have? Infinity. But when sample size goes up, the distribution starts to look more normal means that you're getting new sampling distributions, that a sampling distribution that only has nine people in each average is going to look less normal 
than a sampling distribution that has 100 people in each average. So n refer, refers to the number of people in each average, not the number of people that you have. And let's say you're going to try to estimate a sampling distribution, right? Now, let's say you're going to actually like start gathering some samples to try to like say, I want to just try this at home, right? Let's, I'm going to go grab some dice and I'm going to start trying this at home. And I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to start rolling dice, rolling dice to try to see if this works because we're actually going to do that as part of this lecture. We're actually going to look at um, what's called the Monte Carlo study, which uh, come, that name comes from Monte Carlo where they do a bunch of gambling because data analysis is super important for people who, uh, you know, make bets for a living, right? Because we want to know what it's going to look like forever, right? So in a Monte Carlo study, you play pretend. You set a parent population and you start drawing samples from it. But we can't actually draw an infinity number of samples. So let's say we only grab 100 samples, right, where each, where each sample has 100 people in it, right? 100 is trying to estimate infinity, right? We're just, we can't get, we, I don't want to have to roll a die more than 100 times, right? But keep in mind, 100 doesn't become your sample size. If I grab 100 samples of 10 people, the sample size is 10. It's just 100 is trying to approximate infinity. If I grab 100 samples of 20 people, the sample size is 20. 100 is just trying to approximate infinity. So keep that in mind. As sample size goes up, that phrase does not mean as you get more samples, because theoretically you have an infinite number of samples. That means as there are more people in each sample, then the sampling distribution of the mean starts to look super, super normal. Because when, we, when, we're, when we're actually trying to test our theories, when we test the sampling distribution, right, even computers can't calculate an infinite number of averages because infinity would take literally forever. So even when we're just trying to approximate sampling distribution, after about 10,000, I give up. So, but remember, 10,000, if I grab a 10,000 samples, 10,000 is just trying to approximate infinity. Does that make sense? And the more samples I grab, 10,000 samples, 100,000 samples, I'm just trying to get close to a true sampling distribution and the more samples I get the better approximation I'm going to have of infinity but sample size still means how many people are in each sample just as you gather more samples you're getting closer and closer and closer to infinity so you're going to have a sampling distribution that looks closer and closer and closer to that truly hypothetical theoretical infinity land idea of get me an infinite number of samples right? But keep in mind, sample size is how many people are in each sample. If I grab 10,000 samples, each with 10 people in it, sample size is 10. If I grab 10,000 samples with 100 people in, it, in each sample, sample size is 100. And 10,000 samples of 100 people are going to look more normal than 10,000 samples of 10 people. That's the idea. So, to sum up the rules, of the central limit theorem. Start with a parent population where you know mu. Like IQ. Start with a parent population where you know sigma. Standard deviation. Standard deviation. If you know that the original parent population has an average of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, you know that an infinite number of sample IQs, an infinite number of average IQs, an infinite number of means, a sampling distribution of an infinite number of means will also have an average of mu. The mean of the sampling distribution of the mean, the average of my infinite number of sample averages, which I could graph and create a sampling distribution of the mean, will be equal to the original population average. The standard error of the mean, which is our new name, standard error, standard deviation of a sampling distribution, the standard error of the mean will be equal to sigma over the square root of n. The original population average, um, excuse me, the original population standard deviation of 15 divided by the square root of n, whatever n is. If n is 
is is 10, then 10 goes where n is. If if there was 100 people in each in each average, then 100 would go where n is. And as sample size goes up, as you go from n equals 9 to n equals 25, as sample size goes up, the new sampling distributions look more normal. A sampling distribution of 25 people in each average will look more normal than a sampling distribution of only nine people in each average. So these are the three rules. And it's just, it's, it's a super important theoretical idea because in our future, in our very near future, we're going to use the sampling distribution of the mean to start thinking about interesting and cool research questions. So try to wrap your head around now what a sampling distribution of the mean is. It is a theoretical, hypothetical, infinity land idea that is real. It really does happen. And we'll demonstrate that now. But once we know what an infinite number of averages are going to look like, they're going to have the mean of all the means will be equal to mu. The standard, standard error of all the means will be equal to sigma over the square root of n. And an infinite number of averages will look normally distributed. And the minute you hit 30 people in each average, it looks perfectly normal. Those three realities, because they're realities, they're rules, are going to allow us to start asking some really interesting and fabulous research questions. Like, does age relate to cognitive functioning? And do men and women have different amounts of aggression? And if I, give, uh, if I do a true experiment where I give one half of my people a real drug, is there, has there been a significant are they going to have less of the disease than the people who got the placebo? These really cool research questions that underlie medicine, psychology, sociology, anthropology, business stats, all of these research questions, we couldn't answer any of them without the central limit theorem. So it's just if the central limit theorem wasn't true. And so hooray for the CLT. Hooray for the central limit theorem. So I expect you to know it. So let's watch the central limit theorem in action. And I'm going to show you the results of, I'm going to show you the results of a Monte Carlo study that I did um, using a program called R. And, um, and, and so essentially what I did is I gathered 10,000 samples. Does that mean N is 10,000? No. That means that I set a parent population. I set a parent population of actually 100,000 cases. Um, I set a parent population of 100,000 cases. So there were 100,000 people in my population. And I told this computer program R, uh, here's my parent population with 100,000 people in it. Um, and the original population average is 2. And the standard deviation is also 2. And the parent population is super skewed. Like, let's say this. Uh, let's say this is you know how many. Remember skewed distributions. Let's say this is the how, how the number of times people report you know hitting their spouse. Most people. And so look at this first box here. Uh, th this is this is an approximation of the parent population. What it looks like, right? With ten, I grabbed a, a, a sample of ten thousand uh, people in it. Right? And so most people say zero. Zero, 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 right? Um, and just not very many people are, you know, hitting their spouses, right? So my parent population is super skewed. It's got an average of two and a standard deviation of two. And it's a very skewed distribution, right? And if I was going to grab, uh, you know, 10,000 samples with one person in each sample, it's going to stay pretty skewed, right? Because an average of one person is just the original score, right? So here is my, my, my sampling distribution of the mean, or sample size is one in this very first box that I have circled, right? The average is 1.995. So the average of all these averages is pretty close to the original population average, not perfect. And the standard deviation, S sub X, is pretty darn close to the original population um, um, standard deviation too. Because this is my theoretical hypothetical sampling distribution where there was only one person in each sample. Well, that's just going to look like the original population, whatever that did, right? So this central limit theorem hasn't sort of started to take effect yet because I'm not really averaging yet. The average of one person is just the original score.
But now this next box here is me grabbing samples of two. And so now there's two people in each average. So n equals two. And so I took two people from my parent population of 100,000 and I averaged those two people's scores together. And now I have a sampling distribution of the mean. Down here are the averages of two people. So this, there were some sample averages with five, but that's because I, I took person one, person two, and averaged them. And then I did it again. And then I did it again. And, I, and then I had the computer do it 10,000 times. So these are 10,000 sample averages of two people. And the average of these averages of two people is was equal to 2.017. Yep, equal to the original population average. The average of all the averages was equal to the original population average. But now let's look at the standard deviation, the standard error. The standard error of all of these averages. Notice that it's gotten smaller. It's now 1.434. And, uh, and let's actually work out what that would be on our calculators. The central limit theorem says that the standard error of an infinite number of averages will be equal to sigma over the square root of n. So sigma is 2 over the square root of n. Well, how many people were in my 10,000 samples? Two people were in each sample. So get my calculator out. Do, do, do. So I do this. I do. I do this, the square root of two. I'm gonna start there. The square root of two is 1.414. So now I've got I've got two over one point four one. And so then I take 2 divided by 1.41, and I get 1.418. So the central limit theorem told me that an infinite number of averages from this population would have a standard error of 1.418. Now in my 10,000 samples, because 10,000 was trying to approximate infinity, what do you know? I got something darn close to what the central limit theorem told me should have been the standard error. Now, why wasn't it perfectly 1.418? Well, because 10,000 is just an approximation of infinity. If I had kept getting samples and kept getting samples, and I had done it infinity, I would have gotten something exactly 1.418. So the central limit theorem is already working. And notice the shape. Already that skew is getting less. Huh, okay. And so now let's look down here. Here is my sampling distribution where instead of having two people in each sample, now I have four people. Notice that the average of all those averages is still two, but the standard error has gotten smaller. Now the standard error is in these 10,000 samples where each sample has four people in it. Now it's telling me that the, that the actual calculated standard error of all of these samples is 1.005. Well, what would this essential limit theorem say the standard error should be? Central limit theorem says that the standard error of all these averages should be equal to sigma, that's 2, over the square root of our sample size. Oh, okay, well, our sample size was 4 now. Well, the square root of 4 is 2, so 2, and so 2 over 2 is 1. Oh, wow, 2 over 2 is 1. Look at that. What do you know? And why isn't it exactly 1? Well, because we only have 10,000 samples, right? But, and look at the shape. There's only four people in each sample, and already my super skewed parent population is creating a normally distributed sampling distribution of an infinite number of averages. And here's my next one. 
Here I've got nine people in every single sample average. The, the, the average of all the averages, still close to two. Standard error is smaller now. And the central limit there said standard error should be sigma over the square root of n. Well, now n was 9. So now we have 9 over 3. And so the central limit theorem said it should be 0 0.6, 6, 6, and then forever and ever and ever. How do you know? This actual uh, simulation of an infinite number of samples has a standard error pretty darn close to what the central limit theorem said it would be. What do you know? And look, it's starting to look scary normal now. That's starting to look like a bell-shaped curve. Averages, averages are going to be pretty darn close to the original population average. The original population average over here was 2. That's not 2. So let's visualize that. When I grab my samples of nine people, I'm grabbing some from here and some from here, right? And so once I have nine people in each average, I'm grabbing people from everywhere here and then averaging them. And so getting samples of nine people close to two is just what's more likely. Getting sample averages pretty darn close to two is more likely than grabbing only people up here or only people over here, because I'm going to be sampling from everywhere. And so sample averages are normally distributed once you start getting enough people in each average. And here, I've got, now I have 16 people in each sample. Now it's looking even more normal, and standard error gets smaller, because now standard error should be 2 over the square root of 16, 2 over 4, or 0.5. Look at that. In my simulation, I'm getting something darn close to what the central limit theorem said my standard error should be over here. We've got 25 people. 25 people. S central limit theorem says it should be 2 over the square root of 25, 2 over 5, 0.4. Central limit theorem said that the standard error would be 2 over the square root of n. Now n is 25 people. 2 over the square root of 25 is 2 over 5 or 0.4. Wow, look at that. My simulation. I'm getting an in, uh, 10,000 samples, pretty darn close. And now the average of all the averages is equal to 2, which was the original population average. And now we here we have 40 people in each average. We've got this, the average of all the averages still 2. And now standard error is even smaller because each average is a better approximation of the population. And so standard error is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as sample size goes up, as there's more people in each sample. And here we have an in, a 10,000 samples in my simulation, each with sample sizes of 100. So now I've got So now in my 10,000 samples, I've got 100 people in each sample. And 100 people is just a better approximation of my parent population than 10 people were. And so each sample average is going to be pretty darn close to 2. And getting sample averages far away with 100 people just becomes less likely. And so the amount of error is smaller. Standard error is smaller. And the central limit theorem told me that it should be sigma over the square root of n which is 2 over the square root of 100 2 over 10 which is point Two. And in my simulation, that's exactly what I get. Central limit theorem works, folks. If you know the characteristics of your parent population,
you know mu and you know sigma, you know exactly what your sampling distribution of the mean will look like. Once you, once you tell me how many people are going to be in each sample, the beauty of the central limit theorem is you know what infinity looks like without actually having to do infinity, which just blows my mind. So, once again, sampling distributions are going to have an, an infinite number of averages, because that's what a sampling distribution of the mean is. And so a sampling distribution of the mean is going to have an average equal to mu. We're going to know exactly how spread out it is. It's going to have the amount of standard error called sigma over the, where you calculate it, sigma over the square root of n. Start with the original population standard deviation. Divide by the square root of how many people are going to be in each of your infinite number of samples. And that is going to be standard error. And you know it's going to be normally distributed. And so once you know what your infinite number of samples are going to look like, then you're going to know exact if when you grab one sample, you're going to know exactly how probable your one sample is. Because let's say I know that, let's say I know, let, let's do, a, let's do a, a quick example with IQ. If you know that, if you know for sure that the average IQ in the parent population is 100, and the standard deviation, and the standard deviation is 15, if you know that, and you tell me that you're going to, and let's say um, you're going to take this like IQ raising class, right? Uh, Jenny's IQ raising class. And there's going to be, uh, you know, 100 people in this class. Or let's use a different number since the IQ, I, average IQ is 100. Let's say you know that there's going to be 25 people in this class. You know now that in the parent population, if you are going to grab an infinite number of samples from the population that has an average IQ of 100 with a standard deviation of 15, you know that the sampling distribution of the mean is going to look like this. You know it's going to be normally distributed, thanks central limit theorem. You know that your infinite number of averages is going to have an average of 100. And you know that the amount that, that the averages are going to be spread out like this. You know the standard error will be 15 over the square root of 25. 15 over square root of 25 is 5. So 15 over 5, which is 3. So the people were spread out with a standard deviation of 15, but now your infinite number of averages, each with 25 people in it, one standard error away is 103. Two standard errors away is 106. One standard error away on this side would be 97. Two standard errors away on this side would be 94. So you know how these averages are going to be spread out. And so you know that a random sample of people, a random sample of 25 people, most of those averages are going to be between 97 and, and 103. 68% of all the sample averages are going to be between 68%, remember those known values? 68% of the sample averages will be between 103 and 97. And 95%... Ninety-five percent of all the sample averages will be, will be between an, an average of one hundred and six and ninety-four. And so, let's say after you take this IQ raising class, you uh, uh, the the average IQ for this whole class was one hundred and ten. That would be here, right? So you start asking yourself, I wonder if the class worked. I wonder if this class effectively raised our IQ. 
and you're saying to yourself, well, I know that in an infinite number of samples, most of the sample averages should be, 95% of them should be between 106 and 94, and yet our class was so much higher than that. I bet we're not just some random sample from the population. I bet we're special somehow. I bet we're special somehow. And that is how you can use all of the different things that we've learned so far. We know about normal distributions. We know that there's going to be 68% within one standard deviation. We know that 95% of, of all the cases will be within two standard deviations. Okay? And now we've learned from the central limit theorem that sample averages are going to be normally distributed. So if you grab an infinite number of sample averages, 95% of those averages will be within two standard errors. Standard error in this case is three. So 95% of all the samples are going to have sample averages somewhere with, within two standard errors. And so if you get something super weird and far away, well, maybe you start thinking to yourself, this sample is somehow unique. And that is how we're going to start asking and answering cool research questions. So let's practice doing this a few more times to make sure how we can see how parent populations are related to the sampling distributions that get created once you do an infinite number of samples. So let's say I've got a population that has an average of zero and a standard deviation of one. I might ask the question, what is the probability of, uh, so I'm just using a different example. Parent population has an average of zero and a standard deviation of one. What is the probability of drawing a sample of four people with a mean greater than one or less than negative one? What would standard error be, right? So first let's figure out what, I, so I'm telling you that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one for this parent population. Because let's say I'm telling you that um, this is how much people like carrots, right? People, and I've, and I've measured it on a scale of like, you know, you know uh, I've measured it on a scale of negative five to positive five, where most people are like, meh, zero, meh, right? And the standard amount people deviate from that average is one. So that's the parent population. But now I'm gonna tell you that I'm gonna grab a sample of four people. And I'm going to grab a sample of four people an infinite number of times. So let's figure out what standard error would be. Start out with the population standard deviation and divide by the square root of n. So the original standard deviation in the raw scores was 1, but now standard error in my infinite number of averages with four people is 0.5. And so notice that the average of all the averages, still 0, but now standard error is 0.5. So on this normal distribution, 68% of my sample averages would be between 0.5 and negative 0.5. 95% of my sample averages will be between 1 and negative 1. Not the raw scores, but my averages will be between 1 and negative 1, 95% of them. The standard error now is 0.5. Let's do a different example. Let's say I have a parent population that has an average of 21 and a standard deviation of 6. Well, let's, and I tell you I'm going to grab nine people. Okay, so the people were spread out with a standard deviation of six. Standard amount people deviated from the mean was, uh, was six. Standard deviation of six. But how spread out are the averages going to be? Because now my infinite number of averages has nine people in each average. So the central limit theorem tells me that my averages of nine people should have this amount of standard error. 0.5. 
So the people were spread out, had a standard deviation of six, but now my infinite number of averages is going to have a standard error of two. That's the amount each average of nine people is going to be an error of the true population average. So standard error of my averages is going to be two. Now the average of all the averages is still 21. But now, one standard error away is 23. Two standard errors away is 25. One standard error away over here, 19. Two standard errors away, 17. So what is the probability of getting a sample of nine people either greater than 25 or less than 17? Well, we remember from normal distributions and standard and sample averages are normally distributed. We know that 95% of all the cases on a normal distribution will be within two standard deviations. Applying this to samples, that would mean 95% of the cases would be within two standard errors. So I've got two standard errors away above would be 25, two standard errors below would be 17. So what's the probability of getting something either greater than 25 or less than 17? Well, if the middle is 95, I guess that leaves 5% left over. 5% would be in those tails, right? Turn that into a probability. If the whole thing is 100% and 95% would be between 25 and 17, at least 5% left over, but I got, but a probability is always a proportion. So I turn that point, that 5% into 0 0.05. There is a, a probability of 0 0.05 of getting something above 25 or below 17. And that's just flowing from all the things we've learned so far. One more example. Let's use that same population where I have an average. of 21 and a standard deviation of 6. Right? That's my parent population. I want to know what's the probability of grabbing a sample of 9 people with just, just higher than 25. I want to know about those people, right? Well, central limit theorem told me that an infinite number of averages will be normally distributed, right? And that they would have this would have a standard error of 6 over the square 6 over the square root of 9 which is 2 and so thank you Frederick Goss for teaching us that 95% of all the cases on any normal distribution would be within two standard errors now because that's our new name for standard deviation and so that must mean in here is 95% or 0.95 and just and then what's left here and here would be 0.05, 5%. And so just over here is half of that. If 0.05 is here and here, then just over here above 25 would be half of that. Take 0.05 and divide it by 2, you get... .025. The probability of grabbing a sample average above 25 is .025. Not very probable. It's only going to happen 2.5% of the time. And so really try to wrap your head around this now because un the tr understanding of this is going to help our next conversation be a whole lot more interpretable, a whole lot more understandable. Um, and so if you have any questions, again, please go to the Q&A form or shoot me an email or come see me in office hours if this, if this is sort of a tough idea to wrap your noodle around. Um, and, and we can talk about it. Happy to help. And the last thing I want to just sort of share with you is this website. It allows you to play with sampling distributions of the mean. It allows you to like, um, and so let me, uh, it, it allows you to sort of play with things um, and like change sample size, change uh, to like see the central limit theorem in action. And you'll need Java on your computer because it's a Java applet, um, but I think it's a pretty good application. So feel free to play with it um, to sort of, uh, sort of 
uh, wrap your head around what the central limit theorem is, is really trying to get at. Um, and uh, or you might want to try like an online dice roller and like so just sort of ask yourself the question if I rolled one die an infinite number of times I'd end up with an, uh, some uniform distribution right the ones the twos the threes the fours the fives the sixes if you roll dice an infinite number of times, the parent population would be uniformly distributed. But if you start averaging dice rolls, let's say you get 10 dice rolls. In order to get an average of one, you would have to roll 10 ones in a row. And that's just not going to happen. In order to get an average of six, you're going to have to roll six, your 10 sixes in a row. But to get an average of three, well, you could roll some ones, some twos, some threes, some fours, some fives, some sixes. Yeah, you probably are going to get an average of three. So even on something like an infinite number of dice rolls, even though the parent population is uniformly distributed, here's what the histogram would look like for an infinite number of dice rolls where you roll the dice once. But once you start averaging dice rolls, you're probably going to get something pretty darn close to three and a half when you start averaging them. If you roll a die an infinite number of times, you're going to get ones, twos, threes, fours, five, sixes, ones, twos, threes, fours, five, sixes. And when you average them all together, you're going to end up getting something like three and a half. And to get six, you'd have to only roll sixes. To get an average of six, and to get a, an average of one, you'd have to only roll once. And so even with like dice rolls, the central limit theorem happens. Averages are normally distributed. And so this applet allows you to play with that and sort of really visualize it, right? And so wrap your head around it now because it's confusing at all. Please come chat with me or please come to my office hours. Please post in the Q&A forum. And I'll see you next time where we put this all together. Yay! And learn about null hypothesis significance testing, which is finally, after many weeks, how we're going to ask and answer cool research questions. See you next time.